good afternoon to um, everybody who's attending this first session of the 6G Symposium. Uh, today's um, agenda. I need to share my screen, so please. So could you please confirm that you see my slides? Yes, I do. Excellent. So um, as I said, good afternoon, good morning to all of our attendees from all over the world. Uh, it's a pleasure for me to be um, a moderator of this uh, first session uh, of today's program of the 6G Symposium Europe edition um, in um, uh, this year, 2020 uh, spring. Um, today's session is all about the 6G system architecture, as you can see from the title. So today we're going to speak about um, how this 6G system architecture will look like. Um, definitely 6G is coming by um, 2030. Um, and how this architecture will look like. Will it be a new one? Will it be an evolutionary one? Will it be a revolutionary one? Um, this uh, session and the whole symposium is being organized by the 6G flagship program of the University of Oulu in partnership with Interdigital as well as with uh, 6G Innovation Center of the University of Surrey. When we talk about the system architecture of any uh, system, particularly of 6G, uh, different keywords and buzzwords will come to one's mind. And here, just a few lists of some of the keywords that we will be addressing today. So we have data analytics, we have AI nativeness, true cloud nativeness, edge cloud um, federation, um, definitely different enhancements will be happening to the radio access network, new network, transport network probably may be needed, high precision net networking. Definitely we have uh, more and more services that are actually in need of extreme low latency. Uh, there is this issue that have to be dealt with always uh, when we deal with um, components coming from different vendors. So interoperability is an issue there that should be addressed in the design of uh, any system architecture. And last but not least, trust and security. But when we talk about all of these keywords uh, and how we can reflect them in the design of the system architecture, are we talking about an evolution or a revolution? Um, and to answer this question, uh, allow me to welcome our distinguished speakers that we have um, here in this session. Uh, we have um, uh, Dr. Uh, Forkett Ziegler from Nokia, uh, Dr. Shi Bi from China Telecom Research Institute. We have Mr. Takehiro Nakamura-san from uh, NTT Locomo, and we have Dr. Richard Lee from Future Way and Professor Ning Wang from the University of Surrey. Um, our distinguished speakers, they will be enlighten us about the 6G system architecture. Basically, we'll be having Dr. Sikler, who is a senior technical technology advisor and chief architect at Nokia Bell Labs, who is going to shed light on the 6G system architecture and what's going to be novel in it. Uh, probably they will be, they will be sharing with us also the perspective of Nokia and how Nokia sees the 6G system architecture. Uh, Nakamura-san from uh, NTT Docomo, who is the Senior Vice President and General Manager of 6G Laboratories, will see the problem from a different angle, a very important angle actually, and basically from how multi-access edge computing or edge cloud in general will support the 6G system architecture. Uh, Dr. Shi Bi, who is uh, the CTO of China Telecom Research Institute, We'll look into the problem from a different angle, a very important angle as well. And here it's actually about the radio access network and how this concept that he has been coining, which is proximity radio access network, how it can enable this distrib distributed 6G architecture. And then we have Dr. Richard Lee, who is the chief scientist and vice president of network technologies of FutureWay, who is going to look into particularly the protocols or the new networking protocols that shall support uh, the 6G um, services or the beyond 5G services. Uh, last but not least, we have Professor Ning Wang from University of Surrey, who is going to shed light on probably new concepts of um, network slicing. I'm not going to disclose it now, but let's uh, hear from him. It's a new uh, concept that he is actually advocating for uh, in the context of um, supporting these different slices uh, that should be coming um, uh, along with the 6G system architecture. Um, once again, I would like to thank um, the panelists for accepting uh, to be part of this event. 
um, which is organized uh, by SIGG flagship um, program of the University of Ulu in close uh, partnership with Interdigital as well as the University of Surrey. Without any further delay, I would like to um, welcome our first speaker, uh, Dr. Forke Sikler from Nokia Bell Labs. The floor is yours, uh, Sikler. Thank you so much, Tariq. So good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, sorry, everyone. It's uh, exciting to really talk 6G, 6G architecture. Why? Because it's a wonderful opportunity for us. It has been now for three or four years. We at Nokia, Nokia Bell Labs have had the pleasure to engage in 6G research now for three years or so. We have had the pleasure, more importantly, to engage jointly with a variety of partners from academia, uh, operators, uh, also uh, enterprise partners, research institutions, uh, HexaX flagship project, by the way, just to mention that, led by Nokia 6G research, a key project. We also, by the way, University of Oldo is a key partner. I think has been up and running successfully. So we have come a long way. Uh, at the same time, we are not fully there yet. And so I think it's appropriate to truly discuss like what's new, what still need to be done. And of course, the one aspect that is uh, exciting is the fact that we have made very good uh, progress in terms of framing what 6G architecture could be and should be, while at the same time now progressing to the stage of, broadly speaking, systemization. And uh, that's part of the opportunity as we progress in this, on this journey of increased level of, if you like, architectural and technology readiness. Next slide, please. So let me uh, take the opportunity, uh, since I have the privilege to kind of set the stage uh, for this uh, in a bigger picture in terms of what are the global trends, the global trends on the road to 6G, including 6G architecture. Just briefly, in case you're not aware, I think this is important because it in many ways also has affected or continue to affect what we need to emphasize, put focus on in conjunction with architectural, in conjunction with architectural choice uh, as we move forward. So first and foremost, yes, we do see, unfortunately, still some significant trend and risk with deglobalization, while at the same time, let's be clear, obviously, global standard uh, continues to be critical. Uh, interoperability matters, economy of scale matters, no doubt. And this, I think, is also very relevant for the architectural work as we jointly have started to do out of, out of research. And now, as I said, moving further uh, towards systemization. Cybersecurity, that's another big one and a prominent uh, threat to begin with. It's also opportunity when you look at architecture, uh, security, privacy, and trust. Uh, what I think we can uh, clearly state, definitely true for Nokia Bell Apps and our research has, uh, is one of the key domains of uh, research. Security architecture is. And uh, when you just look at some of the numbers as we, as the, at the cost, uh, kind of uh, uh, cost by cybercrime, it's, it's, it's huge. And uh, when we look now forward, and we'll discuss this more at some of the technology opportunities and architectural transformation, the use cases empowered by 6G, the scenarios as we will power up, this uh, will actually serve even more attention in going forward. Sustainability, that's another key trend, and, it, and I think it's a big opportunity to make sure that what we do is truly relevant to serve society uh, in the right way in terms of not just reducing carbon footprint, but truly making sure that we are uh, especially environmentally sustainable. So energy efficiency, I think, is in the meantime become a key design criteria, also having big impact on architectural choice. And then last but not least, and I'm aware metaverse is probably a somewhat overhyped over term, but nonetheless, there is this context of virtual asset economy, Web 3.0 kind of as a trend coming up. And this might also translate into opportunity for us out of the 6G architectural work to help uh, contribute, make, make some of these scenarios happen. Next slide, please. So with this clearly, obviously, Network drivers are going to be, going to be different from uh, today's, different than today's. And so when you look at the 2030s, it's truly about the opportunity to go digital physical fusion. It's uh, about human augmentation. 
at the heart of this, you could argue, and we've had this vision now for a number of years, it has served us well. It's about connecting the worlds, the digital world, the physical world, the human biological world. And uh, of course, now by 2030, uh, these elements of boosting productivity, improving quality of life, new use case interaction paradigms then will now um, feed uh, in a powerful way into what some people now uh, have called prominently the metaverse in a, in a very broad sense. This goes way beyond, I think the term goes beyond the original meaning and like from the Snow Crash uh, novel, I think what we now really talk about is uh, all kind of extended reality use cases, mixed reality, virtual reality, augmented reality. And this of course ties into uh, technology architecture of, of 6G. Just briefly, the value drivers, I think we, we already looked at some of these implicitly when looking at the trends. So the one thing uh, I think that we have done well with 6G compared to previous Gs is that we not only looked at KPIs, key performance indicators, but from the very beginning, we said we also need to look at key value indicators, value drivers, and uh, four of these you see reflected on this chart. I, I guess sustainability, trustworthiness, we already briefly talked about digital inclusion as another one. And this is not just about connecting the unconnected, like in remote regions, it's also about how do we include the elderly, for instance. Uh, and then of course, there's this whole theme of strategic autonomy, sovereignty, as some people call it. Uh, and that actually what it really means is that, I, I think it's a good idea that nobody is exclusively dependent on somebody else. Uh, technology architectural contracts, big picture, ubiquitous compute is one, precision sensing actuation. Now, this is a theme I'll come back to in just a, a minute, very powerful theme with 6G, knowledge system, pervasive AI ML, and then last but not least, and maybe that's the one of the more difficult challenges, how do we interact with uh, machines? How do humans interact with machines in the 6G era? Next slide, please. So with this now, let's have a look at uh, what the key areas of the 6G essential infrastructure are. And of course, as you can see, highlighted architecture really is probably the one that uh, stands out. Why? Because it allows us to pull technology enablers together. And at the same time, there's a lot of uh, transformational ideas that we, that we jointly, uh, I think, have the ambition to move forward. Some of them are also evolutionary, let's face it. Just to mention briefly the key technology areas uh, without going into detail, new spectrum clearly is one, right? 100 gigahertz and above. Going AI, AI native also for the AI interface, another very cool idea. Network as a sensor, co-designing networks for both communications and sensing purposes, and then security and trust. And this kind of then ties into some of the architectural drivers. So metaverse, QoS, QE. Okay, sounds a little bit catchy. What is it? It's probably, in the most simple idea, it would be about adaptive uh, data rates depending on the metaverse use case. For instance, AI cloud native, very prominent themes and we could discuss many dimensions of that. And I think we will as we move into the panel. So it's uh, also operational deployment aspects, automation, very big driver, data analytics and exposure, energy efficiency, uh, as well as flexibility and simplicity as key themes. and. Uh, when you look at flexibility and simplicity, you know, it's very simple things also, like uh, when you look at the thousands of small cells, how do you reduce signaling due to handover, for instance? Uh, when you look at a uh, service-based interface, how do we enable, again, like a new signaling paradigm between UE and the appropriate network function, distributed non-access stratum, just to give you an idea. So all of these high-level drivers, there's lots of key items that we can and need to move forward. So with this, coming to the last slide, uh, just uh, maybe summarizing by way of a pictorial kind of try to include in a visual manner, all the various aspects as they impact, uh, as they help us to frame architectural research, future violent system architecture. So what you see here summarizing is an attempt in a, in a kind of layered fashion showing infrastructure, cloud layer and fabric, kind of at the bottom network function layer, application layer, all of this against the very powerful enabling environment, service oriented orchestration, 
And then, of course, you see this kind of vertical item network of networks, where I think it's uh, very important to highlight that we will see in the 6G era, and this has profound architectural implications, millions of specialized local networks. You've seen the beginning of this, you could argue with 5G campus networks, and uh, this that entails architectural choice, uh, like you know, the, all these in-X networks, like in-body, and in car, for instance, what is the, the right protocol that you would need for the local ones? How do you at the same time assure interoperability with a bigger, uh, the wide area network? So this ties into API regime, open API uh, stack uh, across these layers. It, uh, of course, when you look at the lower layer, clearly it all builds on a distributed, disaggregated cloud architecture. It includes and this we also shouldn't forget, it includes all that layer of fabric, like aggregation, metro, backhaul, back optics, and IP. And by the way, uh, that's also an interesting domain for architectural work. Um, so think of one of the key innovations coming up there, spatial scaling, SDM. Uh, um, and so that's also something we, we need to give attention to. And just to uh, summarize, I think it's a huge opportunity, and especially when it comes to topics such as RAN core conversions, joint communications and sensing, as well as going AI native across all these dimensions and smartly also playing with what is real-time, non-real-time integrated service information bus across what had been RAN radio access network and core, but ultimately truly enabling new use cases and applications for the 6G era. With this, back over to you, Tarek. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much, uh, Paul Carino, for this very insightful uh, talk. Um, indeed, um, the 6G architecture will consist of different components. Um, the cloud layer and the cloud fabric, as you have mentioned, will play a major role there. And this will bring us actually to the second uh, presentation or opening statement that shall be given by uh, Nakamura-san, which, uh, which is going to be about the MEC evolution, multi-access edge computing evolution within the context of uh, 6G network. Uh, Nakamura-san, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much for your kind introduction. And uh, yeah, and thank you very much for inviting me to the, this great session and uh, uh, exciting session. And uh, from myself, the, I'd like to explain our views on the uh, titled Make Evolution for 6G Network. And uh, <clears throat> of course, the, we are uh, discussing, studying the variety of the uh, topics on the 6G network. And uh, today I'd like to explain our views on the one of the important topics on MEC. The MEC solution is already uh, uh, exist and uh, providing the variety of the services uh, all over the world. But uh, MEC need to be evolved to provide uh, more uh, excellent services and uh, if efficient uh, manner. And uh, the, my slides explain the, some of the uh, potential evolution of the MEC. And the first, this slide shows a technical trend and the distributed computing storage resources. This is a clearly a uh, current trend. And the exponential growth of the data uh, from such as uh, cameras, sensors, and IoT devices. And uh, sharing connected user devices. This is also uh, one of the very uh, major trend. Uh, for example, the car uh, display camera in public space. These are the technical uh, trend need to be considered for the Mac. Next please. And the mobile and the service application distribution trend. And uh, yeah. Clearly, uh, the distributed run and the CN function over each central and the third party cloud. It's uh, the ongoing trend, and uh, this will be the uh, very common uh, situation in the 2030s, I think. And the service applications and edge adjacent to uh, VLAN, this is also a clear trend. End to end management for run CN, even for the applications. Yes, this is also a uh, clear trend to uh, manage the, our network very efficiently, uh, efficient manner. Next, please. And uh, regarding edge computing, 
the, we think that the service application on the H, H, H for the complementary device smartphone capability. I mean that the applications should work on the H as a complementary manner uh, with the device and the smartphone capability. And of course, low latency is a very important characteristics of the edge computing, edge server. Security also, the less man in the middle. And the local production for the local consumption of the data, uh, that is uh, of course very important. The recently uh, private network is uh, one of the major trends and uh, this kind of the trend will be uh, progressed. Uh, yes. And the pre-processing, to collect only critical bits to a central data center processing. As a focus on the presentation, there are several kinds of the uh, edge uh, implementation deployment uh, included. Yes, so uh, maybe uh, among the uh, several kinds of the edge server, we need to consider the pre-processing at the very uh, edge server for the uh, central uh, server. Next, please. And then uh, we propose that this kind of uh, six year architecture, especially for the edge computing oriented architecture. And uh, we think that the 60 to make the uh, edge computing easier for the end users. And uh, for example, easy, easy to set up for users uh, like a PDU session management. As you can see in the uh, bottom figure, yeah, of course, the, uh, through the API, the, maybe uh, we should provide uh, electronic services for the users uh, uh, to, 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 to create a new service, to provide new services uh, through the, via the API. And the capabilities shift from the central clouds for a smartphone to its computing storage. Maybe uh, we should provide the services uh, efficiently and uh, very flexibly. And uh, we will have a variety of the use cases uh, in the future. And um, network systems, network have to be very flexible. One of the flexible approach is uh, cap capabilities uh, can be shifted uh, from the central cloud server or smartphone to the edge computing, edge storage. And then no less personal data store and the processing of the sharing uh, devices also very important in terms of the security point of view. And, uh, and the last, uh, federal processing over the wireless interface uh, between the device and edge. Yeah, even for now, this kind of the uh, approach has already uh, realized and uh, we are providing some services, but the more advanced uh, way to uh, of the federal processing over the wireless interface between the device and the edge. So these are the uh, maybe a major uh, evolution points for the edge computing we think. Okay, that my presentation maybe, yes. Okay, thank you very much for your attention. Uh, thank you, Nakamura-san, indeed. Mac will have a big role, you know, in, um, in the 6G system architecture, particularly, you know, for those services that are in need of uh, low latency. Uh, basically, they need to be processed at a very nearby, you know, edge. So that's um, um, indeed uh, very needed. And this actually brings me to, you know, a Mac without a run doesn't work. And that's why we have actually the third speaker who is going to talk about uh, a new concept of proximity radio access network. Um, basically from the term, you can see it's proximity. That means it has to be very close to the end users um, and how this is going to support a distributed 6G architecture. This is exactly what Dr. B is going to shed light on. So uh, Dr. B, the floor is yours. Good morning. It is a great honor to be here in the 6G Symposium. My presentation today is the P-RUN uh, Distributed 6G Architecture. So far, many white papers have published with a variety of 6G visions, including fast and instant, ubiquitous in 3D, sensing and immersive, intelligent and virtual, 
simple and intuitive, secure and trustworthy, green and affordable, flexible and open. Many of these visions could be mutually conflicting, and the job now for us is to identify the realistic ones that could actually be implemented during the 6G time period. The frequency spectrum has been rising. Indeed, China Telecom used 800 MHz for 3G, 1.8 GHz for 4G, 3.5 GHz for 5G. For 6G, at least the millimeter wave is expected. This is of course because the expectation of 6G is to reduce latency by 10 times and the speed and the usage by 10 times as well. This moving to high band will clearly cause serious problem in coverage due to the high path loss. Solutions for this problem have been one of the hotly pursued topics. For the solution, we need to examine the history of the architecture evolution. As we all know, radio has been invented in 1895. Mobile communication was proposed in 1946. The cellular concept was proposed in 1947. The core technology that enabled the cellular architecture include frequency reuse, cold channel interference management, and handoffs among different base stations. With the birth of the cellular industry, we experienced the evolution from 1G to 5G within 50 years of time span. When moving to high frequency bands, the coverage naturally reduces. A natural way to solve this problem is to deploy more cells, therefore the concept of ultra-dense network. However, due to the untenable cost associated with the small cell, this concept has been abandoned by almost all service providers globally. Since the failure over here is not because of the concept but the cost, a natural way to mitigate this is to use terminals in place of the small cells and integrate the proximity network that is being developed with the radio access network that needs the coverage help. Therefore, we believe that p run could become one of the possible choices for the 6G architecture. For p run it is clearly a distributed architecture. It is an evolution from the current cellular architecture by using handsets as base stations. The core technologies that could enable PRAN included multi-hop, discovery of terminals, frequency reuse among terminals, co-channel interference management among terminals, and handoff among terminals. With the perfection of these te technologies, the goal of coverage enhancement could be achieved cheaply and effectively. Oh. The value proposition for PRAN for service provider include improving the cellular coverage, increase cellular capacity, integrate the cloud and the device capabilities, and enable new proximity services. The effort of proximity network is not completely new. The D2D capabilities are delivered through the Sidelink standard. First, Three areas before release 16, that is V2X, IoT, and public safety. Despite the long time effort in 3GPP, the progress of D2D in the vertical industry did not match the expectation yet. Most recently, the proximity capabilities are hot again for terminal vendors. After release 17, multi hop capabilities is considered for handsets. The PRAM proposal here is to go beyond by integrating proximity network with the cellular network. To demonstrate the power of the PRAM on coverage improvement, we carried out the field measurements. This is a typical road measurement of the signal strength at a millimeter wave band. You can see that a millimeter wave signal is more susceptible to deep fade with frequent 25 dB phase due to the obstacles in the path of the signal. With the help of the adjacent handsets at a better RF location, these deep phase could be compensated 
sometimes partially, sometimes completely. If we look at the corresponding uplink data rate, we see that the signal phase really put a damp on the data rate. The effect of the signal fluctuation are magnified significantly with call drops. Again, with the help of PRAN, some fluctuations of the data rates are totally compensated, and some of the fluctuations are partially compensated. Of course, the use of PRAN still left room to use other technologies such as the RIS together to overcome the coverage issues. As we all know, there is no silver bullet in wireless communication coverage. In addition to the coverage improvement, PRAN can also improve system capacity. When a person has a weak signal near a group of strong signals, the person can replace this weak signal with a stronger signal from the group. This improves the data rate of the person, therefore the system capacity as well. Simulation indicates that on average the capacity has the potential to double using PRAN. If all the users are near the edge, the edge capacity can even be higher. If we rank all current coverage solutions according to the cost, coverage radius, and shadow mitigations, we see all familiar technologies from UDN to RIS. Now, with the introduction of the distributed PRAN technology, we could add one of the cheapest solutions, improving both radius and shadow coverage. Therefore, multiple antennas, RIS and PRAN, can form a set for a possible low-cost solution for high-frequency coverage. We all know that a low-orbit satellite is considered a potential for 6G. However, the capability may be limited to high-end phones. The minority high-end users may not be able to justify the business. By using PRAN capability, all phones may have access to satellite services through the backhaul of the high-end users. This improves the satellite business model. Distributed moving base stations may be the future of the cellular network. Now, let's look at uh, some of the challenges for PIRA. As usual, research is needed in frequency reuse, discovery, interference management, handoff. In addition to these conventional problems, handset battery power need to be considered because multi-hub uses duplicated transmission power. Further, business models need to be innovated by operators to encourage the willingness to share. And above all, security is the key for the success that include the consideration of transmission security, malicious software security, authentication and encryption, and trustworthy considerations. Due to the limited time today, many details cannot be covered. You are referred to the paper published in the H4G Communication Magazine in the January of this year for more detail. Thank you, Dr. B, for this very uh, disruptive vision of proximity run. I mean, I share with you the view that actually there is an issue with the willingness to share and what's actually the incentive for the end users to share their uh, devices or the capabilities of their devices. There is also security. But I can tell you, actually, there is another issue. I mean, this could work in very populated countries like China, like, um, you know, where you have the chance of having many people around with the phones. But in countries like Finland, where I am, where there are few people, the chances of having somebody to willing to share with you the device could be challenging. But um, with all of these components that we build, you know, this 6G system architecture, be it like the multi-axis edge computing, being the user equipment, being part of it, being, you know, all of these layers that uh, Dr. Ziegler, you know, has uh, mentioned earlier, I mean, without the right protocol to network among all of these and make sure that actually data is being delivered, you know, within whatever budget we have in terms of bandwidth and latency, uh, I think uh, the services will not be successful. And this actually brings us to the uh, fourth um, uh, opening statement, which is going to be given by Dr. Richard Lee from uh, FutureWay, which is about 
what are these novel networking technologies that we would need so we can enable 6G and the services that will come with 6G? Richard, the floor is yours. So can I show the screen or somebody else is sharing it with me? Uh, uh, Richard, we can see uh, your screen. Okay, okay and, yeah, uh, sure. Uh, yeah, I can see it. Hi, everyone. I'm Richard Lee. Thanks for having me here. Um, next slide, please. And um, everyone is talking about 6G, but what is exactly 6G? Actually, it's not defined yet, but its regions and use cases are being identified in many cases, in many places. In order to deliver 6G, some enabling technologies are under development. For example, new radio technology and new networking technologies. Notice that not all 5G promises have been delivered because networking technologies are not ready to support them. Finally, whether 6G is, is successful will rely on whether enabling technologies are ready or not in time. Next slide, please. Many use cases and requirements have been proposed and discussed. Uh, I saw that uh, Walker, Takehilo, uh, Olio also and discussed some of them. And as networking technology is concerned, there are three dimensional requirements. Number one, omni convergence. Number two, high precision K KPI guarantee. And number three, social sustainability. And uh, Walker like, gave many uh, cases and also building blocks. Right? So how can we converge all of them like uh, in an open standardized way. So that's a convergence, for example, like a spatial and or non-terrestrial networks and terrestrial networks and uh, connect the industrial machines and vehicles and uh, physical universe and uh, digital universes and also computing power networks or computing aware or computing first networks, sensing, learning, intelligence, all of them. How can we put them together? We, if we build them like just in a single block and uh, it's, it's sooner or later we will find a problem uh, when we operate them. Like secondly, it's a KPI guarantee like in and uh, connect the industry automation, uh, we need those. Uh, green social uh, sustainability and uh, uh, certainly it's a long-term requirement. Uh, climate is changing. Next slide, please. Uh, we have been developing some new networking technologies at the network layer for 5G and 6G. We designed a packed format to carry and deliver data, information, or knowledge over future networks. Mm -hmm. The packed format mm -hmm. is an extension to the existing IPv4 and IPv6. Syntactically, compared with IPv4 and V6, it has a new module called contract. The contract can carry metadata like API. The contract is used by the sender to specify the sender's intent on how the packet is delivered. The addressing module is extension of IP, uh, extension to IPv4, V6. So IPv4, V6 can still be used, but the users feel free to use any type of addresses, especially when we uh, converge satellite digital universes together. There have been many publications and a few prototypes in, uh, implemented by different organizations in different countries. Every year, there are a few venues for discussion on new IP in IEEE and ACM meetings. Next slide, please. This is an example for convergence of spatial and terrestrial networks. Now satellite is used mainly for access. So you send a packet to the sky in the, in the satellite. The satellite 
sends a slider back. So it's like an access and a termination point. But sometimes it's preferred that a satellite send a packet to another satellite um, because satellites are always moving. The routing agency relationship is always changing. This is a fundamentally different from routers in the Earth. In new IP, the satellite address is a quadruple. It has four components, owner code, shell index, orbit index, and the satellite index. Packets can be routed by uh, evolutionary prediction-based uh, instructive routing, which is the uh, evolution from the segment routing. Next slide, please. High precision KPI guarantee uh, is an essential feature and the capability to connect it, uh, to connect the industrial networks to the internet. It's also used in remote driving, cloud driving, teledriving, teletaxing. The KPI value is carried as metadata in the contract field. Each router use this value and other routing information to send the packet to the next hop. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Some applications like AR, VR, holograms require high, that's too, too much going back. Previous slide. Uh, and are subject to motion to photon time. We developed a new communication method called qualitative communication. In this slide, I give two examples. One is semantics-based qualitative communication. And the other is significance-based qualitative communication. In semantics-based qualitative communications, the router is allowed to convert the original data to something else with the same or similar semantics. For example, here, the receiver will, uh, will not care, does not care about the, the color of the jacket. So when we forward it, when a router is congested, a picture is converted into a few textual and textual words. So later when the receiver and render it, and a picture will be and displaced. In significance-based uh, quality communication, if a router is congested, so it will cut some less significant parts or chunks of the picture so that and in the end, when receiver receives it, and we still can get a rough idea of what the sender sends. So the quantum communication only works for the scenarios where and the receiver does not care about what is exactly sent by the sender. So here, what is received is maximally what the sender is meant. Means, next slide, please. Next slide, yeah, yes, okay. So in new IP, we have also developed multiple technologies to reduce carbon production. So according to public research, the data plan energy consumption takes 54%. Power and heat management takes about 34%. So the energy consumption on the data plan is important. Also, according to some published research, the longer the address lens, more energy is consumed. And the bigger the routing table size, the more energy is consumed. So according to this research, we designed something and, uh, and in addressing, so we use short, but the long enough addressing. And, avoid unnecessarily long addressing. And we also reduce the um, routing tables in size so that we can save more energy. We also develop other technologies in uh, forwarding and transport and uh, traffic grooming and shipping. Next slide, please. Here, is, uh, some, here are some examples of the uh, new IP deployment for 5G, beyond 5G and 6G. Uh, we use it in the uh, campus uh, for manufacturing, in uh, tele-driving. Also, we connect them 
and from the base station and to the um, MEC edge cloud to support some computing, also connect them uh, from base station to the uh, mobile call uh, for the backhaul transport. Next slide, please. That's also the last one. Thank you. So, so thank, thank you so much, Richard. Um, indeed, a very interesting um, uh, statement or presentation. And I could see at least, you know, our panelists, they were also paying a lot of attention. So um, I hope there will be discussion about this. Uh, but uh, I mean, uh, last but not least, we have Dr. Uh, Professor Ning Wang, who is going to um, share with us his view about what should be more than just network slicing. So uh, Ning, uh, yeah. the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, 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 can people see the slides? I will uh, put that in the for Yes, I can feel okay. Yeah, thank you, Tariq. Okay, so uh, basically, I'm uh, uh, Professor Ning Wang from the 6G Innovation Center from uh, University of Surrey. Uh, so uh, um, uh, due to the uh, time limit, I basically uh, want to uh, talk about uh, two uh, major sort of topics related to network slicing. Uh, so the first is uh, in 6G, uh, basically, um, uh, uh, for the moment, it's hard to envisage what are the typical, let's say, use cases, etc., with different uh, let's say service requirements, uh, but uh, what is for sure is uh, that uh, with the new, uh, let's say, emerging applications, uh, we can envisage uh, a wider diversity of or, or even uncertain uh, future service requirements. And in that aspect, uh, we may ask ourselves whether the 5G or renting our slicing could be the, uh, the, the, the best solution uh, to handle the future diversity of uh, applications in the 6G area. Okay, and also we look at uh, the coexistence of stakeholders in the 6G supply chain. Uh, in 5G, we have already uh, envisaged some integration. Uh, uh, people also talk about uh, network networks, in particular the in integration of, um, let's say, uh, satellite communication with uh, terrestrial 5G network, uh, which has already been, uh, uh, let's say, uh, mentioned uh, previously. Uh, but if we uh, expand this kind of landscape, uh, we may also see additional stakeholders, uh, let's say, uh, uh, who can contribute their, uh, let's say, resources in order to form a more sort of diversity uh, um, uh, 6G ecosystem. So here I, I first, uh, let's say, uh, borrow the uh, SC uh, uh, diagram. Uh, to illustrate uh, uh, the, the basic concept of 5G network slicing. So as you can see, uh, different network slices could be provisioned, uh, even carrying, uh, even carrying uh, not only uh, network resources, but also computing or network function uh, capabilities for uh, specific uh, network slices. And in 5G area, we mainly look at, uh, let's say, typical uh, representative service template like EMBB or uh, URC or um, uh, MMTC. So each of them, uh, has very distinct, uh, let's say, uh, capabilities or advantages. Uh, that is why, as you can see, the, the specific shape in this kind of uh, um, uh, uh, optical uh, sort of diagram. Uh, but if we uh, look at 6G, uh, certainly there will be more dimensions, which is not reflected by this um, uh, diagram. Uh, but uh, as you can see, uh, uh, most probably for every dimension, there will be some increased capability. But uh, we may ask ourselves whether this is what we will see in, let's say, uh, eight or 10 years time, 6G. Uh, so basically, uh, uh, what we uh, are looking at is uh, probably more uh, uh, agile sort of 6G service uh, capability. That means you don't need to stick to specific, uh, let's say, service templates, okay? Because uh, in the future, you may, uh, uh, let's say, encounter, uh, let's say, uh, uh, um, uh, applications or services with very complex uh, requirements, which is beyond simple, let's say, uh, bandwidth requirement or, or only low latency. Okay, so that is why we are looking at this kind of uh, concept of 60 polymorphism. So uh, it, it refers to the, uh, let's say, uh, the dynamicity of changing the shape, if you want, uh, for these kind of, um, uh, let's say, uh, capabilities in different dimensions. That could depend on uh, either the, uh, the, the, the on the fly uh, um, user uh, intent or behavior or requirement or the, or the uh, general uh, meta uh, environment. Uh, 
So uh, what I can give as an example is as follows. So previously, uh, we also talked about uh, the concept of metaverse. Okay, so uh, at Surrey, we have been investigating this kind of enabling technology, which is called holographic teleportation or telepresence uh, for, for a few years. Okay, so uh, a simple example I can uh, show is that uh, if you wear this kind of goggle, Okay, and then you view some holograms, either pre-recorded or, or live. Okay, and then depending on the user behavior, the net, that, that requirement on the network will change substantially. So here, uh, I only talk about a, a very basic situation. That is, uh, depending on how you view that hologram, okay, probably in the, in the future metaverse, then the bandwidth requirement could, cha could change uh, uh, very substantially. So, so we have done, already done this kind of experiments. For instance, if you are uh, moving away from a, a, a hologram, uh, um, and then the required bandwidth, because you don't need that high resolution in the first place, then uh, the bandwidth requirement is very low. For instance, um, even 4G could support that sort of um, uh, service. But if you want to have a closer look, uh, by uh, coming closer to the uh, hologram, then uh, uh, you see the, uh, the the bandwidth requirements may increase substantially, especially if you want to zoom in a specific part of the hologram. Okay, but of course this is not only one dimension change of requirement in those bandwidth re uh, requirements, uh, but uh, additionally you may also envisage the additional dimension of requirements. For instance, uh, if if you want to let's say launch uh, some let's say haptic. Uh, let's say uh, communications in the middle of a session, and then that may require some more advanced, let's say, service capability from the network. Uh, so, if you look at how to, uh, let's say, concept support such kind of change of, uh, let's say, user intent uh, in terms of, let's say, uh, 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 changing requirements, you may uh, say, okay, uh, let's provision a, a common level slice for supporting this kind of metaverse. Uh, service, uh, regardless how uh, end users behave, we can always provide this kind of um, most sort of um, uh, sophisticated, um, uh, let's say, uh, uh, service uh, service support. Uh, alternatively, you may have this kind of more fine grained network slices, depending on users, uh, let's say, behavior in terms of let's say bandwidth requirements. And then, if they move or or, or change their requirements, then we are we can also look at. Uh, the possibility of handover between network slices. Okay, uh, but the bottom line is, uh, in the future, if you have a, a wide diversity sort of, let's say, service level, etc., then the conventional we may ask whether the conventional network slicing could be a, 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 a something scalable that can support such kind of diversity or scalability. Right. So in, in six G, we'll look at this kind of probably more uh, uh, polymorphism. Uh, like sort of um, uh, adaptation. So, so on one hand, the network could sense the user behavior or intent in order to proactively adapt, uh, adapt uh, the, the, the service capability depending on the user's behavior or, or uh, user's intent uh, without necessarily, uh, let's say, mapping uh, the, uh, the, the PDU session onto a given existing uh, service template or, or network slice. Okay. And and also we look at uh, these kind of um, uh, uh, the, the traditional provision of network slices. So uh, for the moment, uh, they are typically done through the, the strategic resource allocation or, or network function provisioning, uh, 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 typically managed by single stakeholder like MNOs. Okay. But in the future, uh, with more sort of CC capabilities, uh, we are more, uh, in, uh, uh, let's say, into an open sort of ecosystem uh, where a wide di uh, uh, a range of stakeholders could contribute their own, uh, let's say, um, uh, capabilities like sensing, like AI, like caching, like computing, etc. So, so that is why uh, we, we, we envisage the scenario uh, uh, which is evolved from a uh, resource allocation in 5G into more sort of a resource composition in, uh, in, in 6 year uh, that can be either based on long-term build capabilities based on strategic cooperation between uh, different uh, stakeholders or resource uh, providers, or even that could be built on demand for specific purposes. Uh, and this is why we, uh, uh, we are looking at this kind of um, like, uh, more like a 6G plug and play feature uh, which uh, provides this kind of easy uh, uh, integration or building tailored uh, 6G capabilities involving multiple, uh, uh, let's say, stakeholders in the, uh, in the uh, ecosystem. 
So to achieve this, uh, we need to build, uh, let's say, uh, the uh, probably the, the 6G architecture more in a more systematic manner. So, uh, 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 so we are looking at, for instance, uh, between the 6G clients and the underlying, uh, let's say, uh, resource uh, resource providers, and then we are looking at the um, the feature of service play, plug and play, meaning that once a service uh, client, 6G uh, client, is plugged into the ecosystem, then uh, uh, through that simple service explain, uh, uh, service playing uh, interface. Uh, uh, they can easily express their service requirements, which should be uh, automatically translated into, uh, let's say, network configurations. Uh, well, this is not something new. Okay, so we have already um, uh, heard about uh, the, the 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 concept of intent-based network management or intent-based network uh, um, uh, networking. But in that uh, context, we will mainly look at, uh, let's say, uh, how to uh, let's say translate a specific service requirement into network configurations within a single uh, stakeholder, okay, like MNO or, or ISP, okay. Uh, but now we are looking at probably more sort of distributed uh, uh, 6G, uh, 6G ecosystem, and, and, and that may uh, uh, certainly introduce additional challenges on how to um, carry out distributed or parallel uh, resource configurations involving different uh, or even heterogeneous um, uh, capabilities uh, from different stakeholders. And then uh, down to the narrow side, we also look at uh, the knowledge, knowledge playing plug and play. Okay, so certainly in 5G area, although AI has already been widely mentioned in managing or treating uh, uh, network resources, uh, well, uh, in 6G, we have this kind of multi stakeholder collaboration for building, let's say, this kind of truly end to end uh, service capabilities. Then we are looking at uh, this kind of uh, what we call the game of AI. So that means every stakeholder may run its own AI, uh, but we need to make sure these AI clouds or uh, um, functions could interact with them in an optimized way so that uh, not only the entrance service capability is, um, uh, is achieved, but also individual stakeholders can uh, achieve this kind, kind of win-win situation uh, in terms of, let's say, their revenues. And then down to the control plane, this is all about decision-making process. Okay, so, so certainly they will be driven by the knowledge from the knowledge plane. Uh, and then we look at, uh, let's say, distributed control or uh, controllability across different stakeholders. And, uh, and then last but not least, I think time is up. Uh, uh, basically, we look at uh, data plane integration. I think it's good that Richard just mentioned this kind of, um, uh, let's say, uh, 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 evolutionary or revolutionary uh, sort of, uh, let's say, addressing such as uh, uh, new IP uh, uh, sort of com uh, concept that may, uh, let's say, give some, uh, uh, let's say, uh, 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 some solid support to achieve what we call a data plane. Uh, plug and play where uh, these kind of um, uh, IP headers could be commonly recognized uh, across different so that it is much easier to build the end-to-end -end service capability across uh, even heterogeneous, uh, heterogeneous network uh, uh, infrastructures. So as a summary, uh, basically we're looking at uh, this probably not fixed service template as uh, uh, what we see in 5G, which is uh, only uh, encompass, uh, encompass a small uh, number of, uh, let's say, representative use cases like EMBB, URLC, et cetera. Uh, but we are looking at probably more IGEL sort of adaptation of 6G capability according to specific or diverse uh, requirements in the future, especially by taking into account possibly user intent driven uh, uh, service support in dynamic environments that may also require uh, sophisticated and accurate sensing in order to enable such kind of network automation uh, on the fly actually. And then we look at, uh, let's say, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the, the scenario of service com uh, resource composition in this kind of multi-stakeholder 6G ecosystem, which may require systematic, uh, let's say, um, uh, uh, design of 6G architecture, uh, especially by taking into account the multi-plane uh, plug-and-play requirements uh, uh, um, uh, in the future. Yeah, that's all from me. Thank you very much. Uh, th thank you, Professor Wang. Um, indeed, um, um, very insightful um, statement. Um, definitely, AI will play a major role in um, in 6G, and there will be need for that kind of knowledge plane that you have mentioned. 
Now, when it comes to the 6G consortium, as you have been coining it, I don't know how the community will receive it, uh, but um, uh, quite an interesting concept. So um, once again, thank you all for this, um, for your opening statements. Uh, it seems we have a number of questions on uh, question and answers. Personally, I have lots of questions for you guys, but uh, definitely I would like to give uh, priority to the audience. Um, I, I invite you to look at the question and answer tool. I mean, the, the list is over there. Now let's take the first question, which is coming from Masoud Shokernezat. Um, of course, he thanks you for the informative presentation and the question is about semantic communication and networking have long been research, research topics. Uh, will, 6, will 6G be the right system to finally involve them practically? If so, what improvements can be expected? So maybe this is a question that should probably be taken by Richard or anybody else because I see their semantic and so on and so forth. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, thanks. It's indeed it's a, it's a really good question, and fundamentally, actually, this question is about how we go beyond Shannon limit, right? So that's too much to talk about it. Second is that how let's get practical, right? So how can we use it? Uh, I'm a networking guy. Actually, in order to make that happen, there are at least two groups so researchers, engineers work together. The one side is on the end host side, and host, so the generation and, uh, and uh, completion, conversion. Second, it's on the rendering, right? how to render it, right? So, uh, so when you generate a semantic-based user data, or I call that a qualitative payload, right? So uh, how do you encode? them and also give some meta encoding information somewhere so that uh, uh, on the receiver side, they can decode and they can recover. Because the problem is that when the rece what receiver receives is not directly used. Some information has been lost, you need to recover them. So, so that's from another uh, group of, um, uh, of researchers and, and some Actually, probably next week, there was some a, a, a presentation or webinar uh, given by, by a professor from Queen Mary University in London. And uh, so I'm a networking guy. So in that network, so I consider how to forward a quality or semantic space, a quality paper from one hop to another. So here, all the, all the challenge is that the payload is too large. Our bandwidth is, is limited. We cannot support it to fold them. So in this case, you know, in new IP as I presented, we have some like a, a contract. A contract that basically is a sequence of condition action on some middle data, right? So the action is that the reduction or converter. So, but may, uh, picture usually or video is usually big, but the textual information is usually small, like me here, like uh, probably you do not care about uh, how long my hair is, color my shirt, right? So it doesn't matter it's for people who already know me, so they can know what's, what Richard looks like. So when they display it, just display a, you know, a picture, maybe that's not exactly you know I look like now, but that's good enough. If we use traditional technology like IPv4, V V6, like if you lost uh, data, so in the end, you have nothing to display. Or if you retransmit it, and uh, that might be too late. This is especially for the, uh, for the like holographic teleporter, like uh, Ning Wang presented holographic teleportation there. For holographic teleporter, the latency is vital, vital. Like otherwise, it will not be called a teleport. So uh, you, have no time to retransmit the lost uh, and packet. So maybe I should stop here and I'm, I'm open to more discussions offline. Uh, there's uh, so much to talk about and uh, about it. Uh, we also have several papers. One recent paper was published uh, MSN 2021 in December, right? So we described something there. Thank you, Richard. Thank you, Richard. I think uh, that's a very interesting topic. You know, uh, 
semantic networking, semantic communication. Uh, I've seen some papers that talk about it as being the one of the key things, you know, in 6G. But um, for the sake of time, we have to move on to the next question. Uh, the next question is coming from Michael Breitenstein. Um, and it's about network slicing um, on public networks is today conflicting with the regulations on net neutrality. I think this concerns mostly Europe. So I would, so how do you envision this to develop? I mean, I have here two candidates that could answer this question, uh, Folke or Ning. So but I would probably invite Folke first and then Ning you can add. Yeah, thank you, Tarek. And indeed, Michael, it's a relevant question. I'm aware. Uh, uh, of some such discussions in France, in Germany also, and probably many other European countries. So I think the opportunity for us is to make sure we educate government, stakeholders, regulators, but more importantly, society at large. We need to educate society, actually uh, folks we, we serve, people we serve, uh, of what the benefits are of uh, making sure we we don't stick to a paradigm that uh, now for 6G probably no longer applies. Namely, there is elements of flexibility. Slicing is one such element that go beyond just wide area coverage. And slicing is one of the instruments to make that happen. It's not the only one. And that's what we need to discuss. And by the way, Tarek, it's interesting because basically even today, we don't have full net neutrality. You could argue we have special priority for emergency service. And that's the way it should be, right? And now we're going forward, like look at frequency regime uh, for local campus networks. It's a good starting point. Nobody would argue like what you do within your own house should be fully neutral. And I think that's another good starting point to uh, uh, do the discussion, but it all starts with, I think the opportunity we have leveraging new technology, including slicing specialized sub networks uh, as a complementary uh, approach, of course. Uh, and that's what we need to tackle jointly. Absolutely agree. Thank you, Volker. Ning, do you want to add anything to what? Uh... Uh, uh, yes, uh, actually, I'm, I'm maybe talking about uh, probably on the technical side. Okay, so so if you compare, uh, let's say, uh, now slicing against the old generation of, let's say, differentiated services, okay, so probably uh, at, at least uh, from my side, I think there are key uh, sort of differences between them. Uh, in, in my view, uh, network slicing is not this kind of prior, prioritized sort of uh, service tiers. Okay, so uh, one service template has higher priority than the other. It is uh, uh, designed to cater for specific requirements. Okay, so it's not, it's not like who, who pays more will get a better service. Okay, uh, and, and then into 6G, this, this is why uh, we, we want to uh, promote the concept of, um, uh, let's say, uh, um, this kind of polymorphism. So, so that means uh, if you don't want this kind of strictly sort of provisioned, let's say, uh, service classes like uh, EMBB or URC, if you argue it is uh, against net uh, neutrality, then let's make it more flexible. Okay, so whoever wants some distinct, uh, uh, let's say, um, uh, resources or capabilities, then the network will be able to adapt its capability to support that. So, so, so hopefully this kind of let's say, uh, agility could circumvent the argument of, uh, uh, let's say, net neutrality in the future. Yeah, that's from me. Thank you, Nick. Uh, Nakamura-san, I, I, I mean, I, I really wonder if net neutrality is is uh, is a regulate is a regulation issue or. Um, um, I don't know, concern, you know, for Japanese regulators? And if it's the case, how do you deal with it as uh, an operator? Actually, uh, we don't have a much discussion on the network neutrality in Japan. Yeah. So problem is resolved. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But of course, that could be a very important topic. And we will, we need to have a, some kind of discussion according to the progress of the discussion in, for example, Europe. So uh, yeah, I, I personally uh, had a strong interest in that and uh, we need to uh, carefully address on that topics uh, for the uh, future discussion, possible discussion, even in Japan. Thank you, thank you. Actually, I was, I was thinking that, uh, I was really expecting this answer. Probably in Japan, net neutrality is an issue. It's actually an opportunity for different businesses. And that's why I think the largest number of MVNOs, if I'm not wrong, is actually in Japan. 
Um, again, we have another question, which is quite interesting. It's about the 6G AI nativeness. And I would like you, Nakamura-san, to stay with me because I think this should, maybe it's relevant to an operator such as, uh, you know, the one you're representing. Um, so definitely, if we want to make 6G AI native, um, you will be having components with AI agents or AI models coming from different vendors. Um, and then you may be having a multi-vendor issue or multi administrative you know, multi, you know, this kind of interoperability between the AI models that could be coming from different vendors within different components of these vendors. How do you see this issue? How do you, do you see this as an issue? And, how, and if it is the case, how do you think that uh, Entity Docomo could address this um, 6G AI needs of this uh, issue? Yeah, <clears throat> AI solutions are uh, already, uh, uh, Providing uh, provided in the market and uh, mainly uh, the, we are using the AI technologies for the services, not the uh, network network functionalities. And uh, for the network functionalities, of course, the, we will deploy the AI solutions uh, more and more. And uh, but uh, in any case, the, for to realize the multi vendor con uh, configurations, uh, we need to do the test. The recently, uh, Oran. Open run is uh, one of the very uh, major topic, and uh, we can deploy the uh, third party software and uh, excellent software uh, and uh, integrate integrate them uh, to uh, uh, <coughs> to build up, build up the systems network systems, and in order to do that, the integrator should do the testing, uh, more, yeah, interoperability testing. That is a very essential. For the integrator, yeah, Docomo is uh, uh, actually uh, one of the integrator, and uh, we are trying to uh, we are trying to do the testing efficiently, including that maybe uh, possibly uh, AI technologies also. So maybe that could be the mm, uh, way to implement the uh, AI solutions that was that will be provided by the merge group vendors. Yeah. In any case. Thank you, Nakamura san Anybody who wants to add to this, um, I mean, this is a very important question, and I think. Many of you should be having, yes, uh, uh, Portland, go ahead. Yeah, I wanted to add one more. So building on what you and Akamura said, that, I think there's one exciting uh, piece of research work. It, it's gone beyond just research at the time. It's about layer one, AI nativeness for radio. It's, it's a pretty cool idea and concept that just to share it very briefly in one or two minutes. The idea is whereas today with 5G, 5G advanced, we are already very successful with using machine learning AI for individual algorithms like digital pre-distortion, beam forming, packet scheduling, what have you. The vision now is, the idea we have is that we will optimize the entire layer one, right? And therefore let the figure, let this system, so to speak, figure out the best possible constellation pattern, uh, taking into account thereby even variants of components, right? So that I think is, is one of the cool examples how AI, uh, what AI nativeness may eventually mean. And with the associated benefits in terms of performance gain and, and energy efficiency gain. Yeah. Um, yeah. Thank you. Uh, yes. Anybody? Who, yeah. Yes. Please, Dr. B. Uh, okay. okay. Uh, thanks. Uh, from a uh, provider's view fund, uh, we think that uh, we already have a, a large set of uh, the uh, applications uh, in the uh, services, uh, you know, uh, to use AI. As you know, that AI has been very success successful. Uh, in uh, video, in uh, uh, speech, and uh, that has a lot of uh, uh, services that the service provider can have. And also, uh, uh, as a service provider, we hope that AI will take an uh, important role in the uh, uh, system operation and maintenance OEM part, and, uh, so, and also the optimization of the network. Uh, however, we think the challenge is really in the uh, the use of AI for network, uh, especially for physical layer and, uh, and uh, itself. And uh, we currently hear a lot about uh, the, uh, the use of AI, uh, for example, pre-distortion and so on and so forth. And we are yet to see the impact in terms of the improvement in KPI. I'll give you an example that uh, you know, the, the use of MIMO has been 
uh, considered for 5G and definitely for 6G because it cannot provide a double, triple, quadruple of capacity. However, for AI, we have not seen that magnitude in terms of the improvement in the physics there. So we really look forward to hear any uh, exciting uh, uh, progress on that in terms of real impact on KPI. Uh, Dr. B, since you are with me now, and um, uh, although it's not really asked there, you know, among the, the questions and, uh, you know, asked by the audience, but, uh, you know, for, for in the context of proximity run that you have shared with us earlier, what are the incentives, in your opinion, for the end users? Why, what would an operator give me so I would share my device and the capabilities of my device with, the, with the, another person? Uh, yes, uh, that's a very good question. And uh, uh, as we know that uh, from architecture viewpoint, and uh, we use the cellular architecture for about uh, 70 years, and uh, the expert in this field seem to uh, think that we are close to the end for the cellular structure because uh, uh, the uh, rejection of the UDN. Uh, we can no longer uh, shrink the cell uh, size to even smaller and smaller because of the uh, flat R pool. Therefore, uh, in order to continue to provide a higher data rate, better coverage, uh, we needed to have a change in the architecture. And therefore, uh, the idea of uh, uh, D2D and also the proximity network. And uh, for the proximity network to work, as I, as I indicated, there are three roadblocks and uh, certainly the uh, uh, willingness of the uh, uh, consumer to, to share is one of the major roadblocks needed to overcome. And before the uh, uh, invention of uh, blockchain, I would think that nobody will think this could be possible. However, uh, with the Web 3.0 currently, uh, in progress and if the internet uh, can do the web 3.0 the question is why the network cannot uh, of course uh, the success of the proximity network will require major operators to design or devise a incentive program for that to happen and if you look at the uh, uh, blockchain, the successful blockchain, you can see that uh, it is precisely because of the incentive program design that made it possible. And uh, we most of the time uh, as a service provider, we put the innovative task to the vendors and they solve our problem, we just buy the equipment. <laughs> now, it, there is a time for a service provider to innovate themselves so that we can uh, catch up with the trend of uh, Web 3.0, and uh, based on my understanding of the evolution and the need for that, uh, we think uh, it's possible that the 6G, one of the characteristic of 3G, is not only the uh, improvement of the KPI, but also the uh, users will own part of the network and part of the operation. Of course, uh, once that, once that. Uh, incentive uh, program is designed and if it's successful, have enough incentive for the consumers, it will definitely benefit uh, the, uh, uh, the, the growth of the cellular uh, architecture as well, because now the reuse is not only between cells, but also between the terminals. Uh, th thank you so much, uh, Dr. B. Indeed, it's a very interesting uh, way of seeing things and uh, I'm, I'm happy to hear that the service providers start working on the issues rather than just offloading them to vendors and telling them find a uh, solution. Um, a very, uh, very interesting um, uh, approach. Um, I see actually on the list two questions which are actually going in the same direction. And I see from the audience that we have actually quite a number of researchers from academia. Um, and and uh, uh, one of the question, I mean, actually there are two questions which go in the same direction. Um, I will read the second one, which says, how these high level design or principles in 6G uh, how will they guide the future research topic or directions? So basically, um, we are in academia, we want to do research on 6G. It is still at, you know, 6G at the initial stage of being designed. Uh, 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 Volker and also Nakamura-san, what kind of advices 
uh, would you give to research in academia so they can actually steer or guide them in, in conducting their research in, in, a, in a meaningful way and also in a way which is, let's say, it, it will bring some impact on standards. Sikler, the floor is yours, and then Nakamura san I would like to hear from you. Yeah, it's a, it's a brilliant question, Tariq, and I, I think it's a very broad one, but indeed, my, my advice would consistently be it's about asking the right questions. It's about asking the right questions. Now, this is uh, uh, now getting a little bit more sophisticated as we move forward because some of the big questions have been asked and uh, we've made some progress, right, Tariq? When you, I mean, you and I actually, like Amura said, many of the panel, we, we started to, I mean, I'm a skier, right? When we, when we engaged on 60, 60 architecture first time three, four years back, it was like deep powder snow, no tracks in the snow. In the meantime, there is many tracks. It's not yet pieced. It's not yet like mass tourism setting in for skiing. No, but there's some tracks. So now I think the opportunity for academia also is look at some of the tracks, look at, you can still question, are they all in the right place? But now I think the opportunity really is to go deep. And that's where academia is needed, right? So the framing part is you could argue done. And now we need to dive deeper in a variety of ways and actually uh, one of the areas I would like to highlight again, I think it has come across from many of us, is uh, the domain of energy efficiency, cutting across a variety of academic technology research fields, all the way from uh, you know, ultra dense uh, radio, massive MIMO, to the way of how to effectively split work between edge and device. I think it's a topic Nagamura's like highlighted, uh, and it's, it's very relevant, it's real also from energy efficiency perspective. And in the big picture, as you will know, 50% of energy is burned by devices. Not So maybe that's another big framing question. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Volker. Nakamura-san. Yeah, I think that uh, there's still 60 discussions, uh, very uh, preliminary phase. And uh, uh, in any case, we need to uh, continue the discussion to, to build the concept of the 60, especially I'm working for both radio and the network. I think that the radio side, maybe uh, the major technologies has already identified almost, no, not almost, but uh, yeah, many uh, typical uh, technologies are identified. But the network side, we are still struggling. <laughs> yeah, I'm discussing with my colleagues what the major technologies, what the uh, major direction of the enhancement of the uh, network uh that need to be clarified but still under discussion and uh, it is very important to gather the uh, proposals from the academia and uh, industries and uh, and then the, it is important to build up the the whole concept of the 16 network in the uh programs some programs or some project all over the world yeah even in Japan, that we have a uh, Beyond 5G promotion consortium, and uh, we have a, a good discussion with the academia there. And also, yeah, in Europe, I know that HexaX is a very nice place. Yes, Hokkaido is a very, very, very active for, in that project. And and then maybe uh, the each project programs uh, build up that some kind of the concept of the 6G network. And then uh, we will we need to discuss between the programs and the uh, projects. So that the, before going to 3DP, hopefully we can have a common views of, or common directions of the uh, evolution of the uh, 5G network toward the 6G. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's really very interesting to hear from you, Nakamura-san, that even within Docomo, you see that the, 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 the problem of networking is becoming much more contrasted in the context of 6G. So there is, I mean, even if you have, I mean, all of these fancy services, metaverse and so on, that we need lots of, um, as Richard was mentioning, you know, this high precision KPIs and so on and so forth. But if you don't have the right networking technology to deliver, then it could be the bottleneck becomes the network. And this actually brings me to one of the questions, which is um, actually directed to Richard Lee, um, where uh, the question says, high precision KPI guarantee is useful for many 5G, 6G applications such as industrial manufacturing and control or ICT and so on. But what is about qualitative communication for 5G? 
beyond 5G, 6G? Can you give examples about the certification? And also, can you really address this general problem of networking and the, you know, the, the, the bottleneck that uh, the network may, may, may build you know, for supporting this kind of uh, bandwidth intensive, you know, latency sensitive applications like metaverse and so on? I mean, just build on, on what uh, Nakamura-san mentioned just earlier. Excellent question. It's a very useful question. Here for 6G or 5G here, I have two examples. One is a short-term to mid-term one. Another is a long-term one. Short-term short to mid-term one is about driving. Uh, long-term one is about a holographic type of communication. So in driving, and you know, there were some cases like, uh, like Uber, right? So you drive in the car. In the future, you might drive it at home or in the office. So in a vehicle, Usually there are 10 plus to 30 plus cameras in your car, in the front, in the back, on the left side, right side. So when you drive it, the camera image from the front is more important than from back, left side, right side. So it would be significance based quality of communication. So when a network is congested, right, in the same packet, if your job, the the data from back camera, it doesn't matter, right? But uh, if you drop the whole packet, so the driver will not see what's happening in the front here. So significant significance based uh, quality of communication is important for the for teledriving. And so and um, and also uh, when we include such uh, like image, and uh, so there are some hierarchical way to do that, and. Uh, and so the driving is one. For the long-term one, uh, holographic type of communication, and all the, the application is subject to motion to photon time, that's a 10 milliseconds, uh, 20 milliseconds, right? If you do a good time budget, probably network transport takes less than 10 milliseconds, usually five to seven milliseconds here. So in this case, you cannot transmit the data holograms bits wise from the center side to the right side because the network could be con congested. So in this case, either you use significance based or semantics based quality and communication to drop those chunks that we will not affect the communication too much. Yeah, so uh, because of time, I will stop here. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. Indeed, actually I was, uh... Um, I was told that actually we are almost there, so we have to close the session. Uh, there are still a number of very interesting questions, you know, coming from uh, one of the attendees, and actually they are directed to uh, Volker Nakamura-san and Ning and Wang. Ning Wang. Uh, so please uh, feel free to address them. Um, once again, thank you so much for uh, being part of this session of um, 6G is coming. Is it going to be new network architecture? This session has been part of the 6G Symposium Europe uh, edition 2022. Uh, it has been actually sponsored by uh, 6G flagship uh, program of the University of Oulu in partnership with Interdigital and also 6G Innovation Center of the University of Surrey. Thank you so much for being part of this. Thank you also to the audience for making this a very attractive session. It has been a pleasure hosting you here and I'm looking forward to uh, seeing you face to face one day. Till then, I wish you all the best. Thank you.